Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for coming on this beautiful evening. I'm going to make special welcome to uh, two folks visiting us in a little while and in introduce you to them and to those who are watching. But it's, it's been a lovely day so far in many ways, outwardly, and I trust this morning we had a blessed day. The theme that I, we focused on in our worship and teaching was this, my sheep recognize my voice. Drawing from the text of, of John chapter 10, where Jesus speaks of himself as the gate to the penfold and also as the good shepherd. And we were asking the questions of ourselves if we knew his voice, if we could hear the voice of God in our lives, and can he hear our voice speaking to him? So I'd like to develop that theme of hearing the voice of God and just presenting it in a slightly different way this evening. And our worship always has a purpose and a direction, themes to it. And if I can read some verses to introduce our first hymn from Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Friends, as we gather on yet another Sunday to preach the gospel of salvation and our, our purpose that we're driven that everyone will know that their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's the opening theme of our hymn, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. So we'll rise to sing after Margaret's introduction. It's the kind of hymn you wish there were, but three or four more verses we could sing heartily, but that's it. Three. So let's uh, commit ourselves to the Lord as we begin in prayer. So let's pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name that we're here in your house, a place that you have set aside in this community and in every community for your people, those with a heart for God, those for with a love for Jesus and a desire to follow him, have gathered on this beautiful evening. We thank you, Lord, that the poignancy of such a day, the stillness, the beauty, 
And Lord, we want to give thanks to God who is the creator and sustainer of all life. It is he who gives us breath and it is he who takes it away. We say, blessed be the name of the Lord who gives and who takes away. We thank you, Lord, for our lives, for the very breath that we're experiencing this minute. And we do so, Lord, not with arrogance, presuming that we will breathe for many years to come, but we pencil into our thoughts that this day, this day could be the day when our names would be recorded in heaven as we come before that great white throne. For no man knows, no woman knows the hour of, the, of God's visitation when they shall be taken from this earthly domain. So help us, Lord, in, in the hours that we have together as a church and in our homes too, to prepare our hearts to be mindful of the spiritual things that so often are disposed of by the world as it careers about its busy schedule. We make this space on a Sunday evening to make room for God to bless, to speak to us, to tell us of his word and of his promises, which are all yes and amen in Christ. And so our meeting is gathered in the name of Christ, so that what we receive, we receive from the Father and through the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask that the triune God would be present in this church to bless and to reveal the living God, one that we cannot see but yet believe in. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith which enables us to believe in that which we do not see. We thank you, Lord, that we believe that Christ came, that he bore our sins, that he hung on the cross for our, for our sin and for our shame, that he was put to death cruelly and harshly, yet it was for our sakes he was placed in a cold stone grave. But we give thanks to God that the Spirit of God raised Christ from the dead on the third day. The death and hell could not contain him, but he rose triumphant over the devil, over all the powers of darkness, and rises up to the earth to call a people to himself, to call a people out of darkness into the kingdom of light, his dear Son. And so, Father, that's what our, our purpose is, to draw as many within life to call on Christ and to be, to be sure that on the day that Christ will say, welcome. Welcome into the joy that the Father has prepared for you in heaven. Enter into your inheritance. O oh Lord, plant something deep within us that we will have a yearning and a longing to be with God and to see his glory and to behold our Savior face to face. Scripture tells us of such a time in our life that we will see the Lord God. There'll be no more temple, there'll be no more sun or moon, for the, the Lord himself will be the light of all. And, oh God, we look forward to such days. But we pray that while on earth we would taste some of that glory, some of your holiness and presence, that you would visit us in our homes and wherever when we visit people, that we'd share fellowship, we talk about the Lord, and that God who hears our voices would record that we've spoken of him in that scroll in heaven which records all our actions, all our deeds. So, Father, we pray that all our deeds will be found worthy and clean. And to that end, we ask that if we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, even this day, we ask you that you would cleanse us and forgive us through the blood of Christ Jesus. That as we gather, we would be, as it says in the psalm, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those who have a clean, clean hands and a pure heart. So purify us, Lord, not with hyssop, but with that holy blood of Christ, that our offering here will be in spirit and in truth and be perfectly acceptable to you and a great blessing to all who are here and watching us. We thank you for our online family, wherever they may be looking tonight and through the week on our service. May the hand of the unseen God reach out to them and touch their hearts. For, Lord, we've come I've come that my heart will be touched, moved by your spirit, moved by the reality that Christ died for me for my sins, that his love is perfect, that his love surrounds me and will never let me go. As scripture says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So will you embrace each person here, Lord, in that wondrous love, in us in that special place, where God draws near to his people. And may all that we do have a fragrance of heaven and be beautiful in your sight 
and be pleasing to all who are here and watching. We want to honor Jesus and all that he has, Jesus and all that he has done for us. So lead us, teach us your holy ways, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, making choices is a powerful feature of our lives and of everyone's life, and Jesus encountered many people throughout his ministry, and some were, some were very enthusiastic about his message and, and about following him, but so many of them had urgent business to attend to that they said, sorry, Lord, I can't, I can't follow you today. I've got things to do back home. You know what it's like. We work on the land, and the land cannot wait for man. And so enthusiasm at first of all, but the urgency of other practical needs took over. Still others put family life before spiritual life, and they saw the beauty of following and seeking God, but their love for their family and the coziness of their home and all they had was weighed too much upon them, and in the balance they, they settled for staying at home and didn't follow Jesus. And still others, such as the, the young man, the rich young man, a very rich young man who, whose heart in many ways was right. He was a, he was, um, a devoted uh, follower of, of the oral law. He studied, he, he prayed, but yet Jesus knew something in his heart you know, was, was, was missing. And so he tested him to see if he would let go of his riches to follow Jesus and the poor young man. He turned away his head, turned in sorrow because he knew he couldn't do that. So life is full of choices, and we trust that we've made the best choice of life by following Christ, and that is, that is the appeal. And we hope, and we trust that everyone here can truly say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches, I'm told. So that's our next hymn. We'll rise to sing number 319. <laughs>
Beautiful. Well, our reading is the same as it was here in the morning. But for those who are here in the morning, don't worry, I'm not going to preach the same message from start to finish, so you can relax. It'll be slightly different, quite a lot different to be. So I'll read the same verses, John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, and verse 16. The heading is, The Shepherd and His Flock. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought, brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. Now, as an introduction to our next song, I'm going to read another short scripture and then do something that I've never done before. <laughs> Thank you. Prepare the ground, you know. Sing in tune. <laughs> Sing in tune. Oh, thank you. That's good. That's good. Not far off it, actually. From Matthew 11, 17 onwards. To what can I compare this generation with? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We played a dirge and you did not mourn. What can we make of these verses, friends? Seemingly, God wanted to do something, and whatever and however He wanted to reveal Himself and His Word, the people refused to, or did the exact opposite. When John the Baptist came, he neither ate excessively or drank, and yet he said he had a demon. When Jesus came and he sat and ate and drank, they said, Here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of sinners. In other words, and in, in the context of our theme tonight, and recognizing the voice of Jesus. People were not responding as they ought. And I'm going to try, and that's the operating word, try, and demonstrate this. The, the text shows that there's two. You can play the dirge. You can play the sad, sad song, and it can move hearts. And you're supposed to, at times, be moved by dirges and sad songs. And then when it's upbeat and tempo, it's, you're supposed to do as they were doing there, a dance. Now, I don't know, I'm not asking anyone to break into a dance. <laughs> You can relax on that. And then following, it's just going to be a guitar, improvisation, and then we'll lead into the song, I Heard the Voice of Jesus. So this is a musical interpretation of Matthew 11. Probably only one of choices. I had a choice tonight to play the 12 stringer, which is this one, or the 6 string. So I've made this choice. Is that coming through okay?
sheep recognize my voice. That's the title. Well, I remember in the days of my youth. Oh, no, here he goes again in the days of my youth. <laughs> it's a good start. When my father was in medical practice, and he rarely spoke about any aspects of it, of course, it's private, confidential. But there was one aspect of which he did mention, and which we did see visibly. And it contained a silver bowl, a large silver syringe. Are you getting the idea? And the instrument was used not for a wound of the flesh, not to repair some, a growth or infection of the skin, but it was the specific purpose of cleaning out your ears. Yeah, sorry to be a bit gaudy, but it'll be like that for the next just minute or so. Of course, the only reason I know this, it, not that he told me of patients who would come and how dirty their ears were, not at all, but of course we were the ones to receive it ourselves. And you know, I honestly never thought there would be any wax in my ear. I was a clean boy, you washed, bathed at least once a week in those days. So there was no, no likelihood, but you know, he would fill it with warm water, not hot water, and then he'd put the bowl and a towel just next to your ear, and then squeeze s slowly. And well, lo and behold, it's amazing <laughs> what, what came out, what emerged from the dark recesses of that inner ear. But uh, we'll leave that as it is. And throughout scripture, we hear this phrase, let he who has an ear, let him hear. Let her hear what the Spirit is saying. If you have an ear, you've got to listen. But this, the suggestion is, or the inference is, that it takes effort to hear. Anyone can listen, but it's another stage whereby we listen with intent. We listen to what is being said. And there may be, as there may, as there may have been with us, blockages in our, not physical ear, but in our spiritual hearing. There are things within us that block us from really letting the Word of God fully impact us. And God has his means, His heavenly syringe, so to speak, to come and flush things out. And as we confess and as things come to us, we see that they are blockages to God. And that's part of being here under the gospel. That God shows you things that are actually not right in your life. Coming to church to hear the gospel message is not just always about being consoled and comforted and there, there, but it's actually being challenged as to things that we might find out that are hidden in our innermost being that are displeasing and are actually are detrimental to our health. So th that's the theme of the word, how God wants to send his word to you, to me, and to clean out any blockages. Now I'm going to introduce the two people that I mentioned at the beginning. Tonight we're joined by Brian Barrett and Liz, his daughter. And we were here on Wednesday for the funeral service of his dear wife Barbara, your mum, and uh, she was laid to rest at Dalmore. And it was it's very touching that you're here tonight. Thank you, folks. I didn't quite expect you tonight, but it's, it's wonderful that you're here. Thank you for coming. May you be blessed and you by being here speaks to us, so thank you. So at the funeral, I, I spoke a short message about the parable of the sower, which is well known to us all, and the family had beautifully prepared little packets like this, with a forget-me-not in loving memory of Barbara. And inside these lovely packages were seeds, seeds. And the, the family were requesting that those who came would take these seeds, and in her memory, they would plant, it some, plant them somewhere beautiful and be a, a lasting me memorial to her in the generations to come. And it was planting seeds, growing for the future. It was a beautiful idea. And uh, you know, I'm sure people will do, and they'll do it delicately. They just won't open the door and throw the seeds, but they'll plant them with care. So thank you for that. And it led to you know, just developing that theme for from the, the, the parable of the sower, taking the seeds. The seed throughout the parable is the same. You don't get different high grade and low grade seed. It's all the same seed of, of the same high quality. And as you know from the parable, there's just different responses from the people because of certain situations which are blockages, not in their ears, but in their hearts and in their lives. And we can go through it very, very gently and very briefly. It's the same seed, but different responses. And so let us all, again, although we've heard it 
hundreds of times, and people watching, you've heard it hundreds of times, but have an ear to hear something different, something deeper tonight in this parable, and let it apply to, to yourself if possible. First of all, there's those, the first group are those who hear the word, the gospel of salvation, which we preach. And unfortunately, they gain no understanding or value of the inherent message of the gospel. They come empty, they go home empty. And we know friends here and in other congregations, the sad situation where month after month, year after year, people do come like that. They come in spiritually empty and they go out spiritually empty. And though we pray and earnestly encourage them, yet still there's some major blockage because someone isn't moved slightly over the years by the, the, the preaching of the word, then there's a, I would say there is a major blockage. So it's a very sad situation. Uh, but we keep on praying for them because who knows, one day they will turn when they hear just something that will gladden their heart. Then there were those in the parable who initially gladly received the word. As they were listening to me today, they may have said, Amen, preacher. Oh, no, no. Uh, they assent to in their heart. Yeah, that was, and then they might even say it at the door, say, well, that was a good word today, minister. But it's a shallow response because within no time at all, as they get back into the world, the challenges facing them as they face them all will submerge them. And that which they found as valuable for half an hour is bit by bit just f fades away. And within no time at all, it's of no value at all. So it has fallen to the ground. It could have taken root if they had just nourished it and not let, in, not let the, cha the challenges of life. So they forgot the value of it instead of applying it. And preaching the word is is given for people to apply it practically to our lives and to, to see that it will bear fruit. Similarly, the one who hears the good news and it, it, its value is choked by the worries of life and it bears no fruit. Have you ever been in this situation? The bills pile up month by month. There's little income coming in and all your trust and faith and super faith in God seems to just dissipate because the pressures of finances overwhelm. But if we, if we only had the ears to hear and faith to understand that God would provide for us in these times of need. So that's another, another group of people. It bears no fruit because of the worries of life. So they all heard the word, or in context, they all heard the voice of the Lord. And that's the theme, hearing the voice of the Lord speaking to them through whom? Through the gospel message. This is God reaching out to humanity to hear, to, to love, and to receive his son, Jesus, to become followers of Christ. And for various reasons, it benefited them little or not at all. And I just ask the question, as I always do, of people here and watching, does that relate to you? Have you benefited truly, fully from the gospel? Has it only come in partially to your life, but not you haven't let it take full effect? Well, consider that tonight. Let it take root. And lastly, is the one who hears, receives it. They receive it because they recognize this as the seed from God, as being valuable, as being something that's important for their lives. Not something to be just cast away and forgotten, but, but something to really hold on to. When you first, in a sense, discover the reality of God, something is like you don't want to let go. The woman who pressed through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment, she, she knew what the value of pressing in to Jesus was. Pressing in. I'd rather have had the scorn of, of the community and press through and be healed by touching Jesus. She didn't care what the people thought of her because she had a higher goal, and that was to touch Jesus. He spoke to her. The voice of Jesus said, who, who touched me? And you know the story. But she pressed in. So... The word of God to, to others must be seen to, to be truly the word of God, not just another sermon being preached. And when we do that, we, you and I, will bear abundant fruit. We will be the, like the tree that grows near planted by the river, which in its season yields its fruit. Hallelujah. And its leaf fadeth never. I'm 71 and the leaf is not fading, still growing, still hungry, still wanting to know, still not arrived, hungry for more of God. And as, as I and you yield ourselves to God, 
we have an increased appetite for more of that heavenly rain that will nourish the leaves, the roots of our trees. I make no boast in that, but that's just who, who you are too, with people of faith for many years. But we're not as, as one who have arrived fully in understanding. We, we press on, we press in. So it would appear that some, maybe even here watching, let the, let the word penetrate to a considerable extent, but something deep within them causes that word to return without bearing fruit. Like it says on the letter, return to sender. God sends a, a letter, the, the, his epistle of life and salvation, but it's not received, and so it's sent back to the sender. What a sad situation that is too. There is a blockage of some kind, and I, I wonder what it could be. So let's just briefly turn back to John 10 and a few pointers from the, the passage to conclude. First, we have the image of the shepherd, and where is he? Is he taking up the rear? No, no. He's at, he's at the head of the sheep. He's leading the flock. He is leading the flock. They do it differently in different nations. They don't st walk behind with the dog chasing him. The shepherd is up at the front. So the sheep know where the shepherd are going. They follow him. They're looking for every time he turns this way or that way. They, they are following him and they're listening for his command. They're listening for his voice. And I spoke quite a bit today about the voice of the shepherd speaking to flocks and how each, each shepherd knows his flock and each sheep know the voice of their master. and won't, They won't respond to another, a hireling or someone trying to emulate the master's voice. So the sheep are following him. And we want to be a people who are following our good shepherd's voice. Following Christ, not at a distance, not at the rear, not at the struggling, no stragglers. No stragglers in God's flock. We are the, the flock of God speaks of collective unity. We are together as a flock. Now that's what God wants us. There's no place, I believe, really for isolated sheep, isolated Christians. They're to be part of the flock in the penfold, feeling safe, feeling secure, and in that place, of blessing. That's not to condemn any Christian who stays at home and who can't come to church, not at all. But the place to be is in fellowship with other like-minded sheep like ourselves, following, following Christ. Secondly, the good shepherd is willing to sacrifice his own life for the well-being of the flock. And he'll go after the strays, the one or two that are lost. He brings healing to the wounded and he carries those that are weak, as Isaiah 40 tells us. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads them, those that have young. What a heartwarming message and image we have of our great shepherd, the overseer of our soul, that he holds us closely, like a lamb, like a tender lamb. God showing his care, close to us, embraced, in his strong arms, a place where we feel secure. Underneath are the everlasting arms of, of God Almighty, keeping us, holding us through life, protecting us from wild animals and predators of various kinds in the world. The shepherd is looking out to see what's going to come against the flock. And that's the role of the pastor of the church, looking over the flock, seeing what dangers there may be, and intervening before someone falls into a trap. So Jesus has done everything that we would ever expect, all that the Bible prophesied that the good shepherd would do, that he would lay down his life for the sheep. Shepherds don't do that, but the good shepherd has done all that. So we owe him everything. That's what we owe Jesus, because he gave everything to be your shepherd and to be mine. And it's, it's a sad, sad, sad situation where people cannot fully receive and, ex and accept that Christ is their shepherd and be glad about it and uh, sing and dance about it. There's a time to be sorrowful, but there's also a time to rejoice. So Jesus is the good shepherd at the head of his flock and we here and watching, I trust, are all his people following him closely, closely, not at a distance. And as we're close to him, we are listening attentively for his voice. We are looking for him to guide us. We're not saying, well, now that I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm safe, I can just find my own way. No, sheep don't find their own way. They need a shepherd constantly to bring them back to the right path. And so we want to be a people who are truly listening, coming aside to listen to the voice of God in your home, in your private life, spending a little time saying, Lord Jesus, 
I need to hear your voice. I need to hear you guide me. I've got issues in my life, and I just want to still my heart, pray, and wait for you. Maybe there'll be a word in the Bible. Maybe there'll be an impression. Maybe someone will speak to me today and, and speak that word that I need. But we need to commit it to the shepherd of our soul. He's looking out for your well-being for this week. And if you have troubles, commit it to the Lord. Commit these troubles to the Lord so that the hand of the shepherd will guide you to the right people to find encouragement, to find love and acceptance or whatever we need. He will guide us to the still waters, refreshing still waters, lying down in green pastures. Just, just can, you can just feel the serenity and the peace coming upon your soul when we come. Lord Jesus, I'm resting in you. So friends, do you hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you tonight in these words, in any way deeper than you've heard before, in these images? Do you have a, a sense of his love for you, the shepherd's love for you? We pray that you will. If so, let him fully take hold of your heart and let him lead you this day and every day for the rest of your life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God in heaven, we bless your holy name that you have thought it all through about our lives, what is best for us, how to take care of us, how to heal the wounds of our heart and to bind them up and to pour in the oil and the wine of restoration. We thank you, God, that you speak to our hearts, our spirits, our minds, and yes, even to our bodies, to our emotions too, that we would have emotional well-being and peace with God. So, Lord, and to the people here gathered, even those who may st still be in sorrow and grief from this week, will you touch them with that reassuring love that God is with them, that God is near to them and to bless them, that he is their friend, the friend to all who call upon his name. He is their perfect shepherd. Will you gather us all, Lord, under the shadow of the wings of God Almighty? And will you bring us, in a, in a sense, into, in our hearts into that Awareness of our safe haven that we have arrived in a place of security, a place where the wild animals cannot come in and devour us. For God is our protector, our shield. And Lord, we look to you to be that to us, to everyone here this evening and evermore. Amen. So to conclude, we'll sing beautiful psalm, one, two, one, I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come my aid. We'll sing it to the tune, the, the base of Harris. <laughs>
And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen.